The Nigeria Center for Disease Control, MCDC, has reported 125 new cases of coronavirus in the country, bringing the nation's confirmed cases to 54,588. The agency says that a multi-sectoral national emergency operations center activated at level three have continued to coordinate national response of activities across the country. The health agency said that the number of persons who were treated and had recovered from the virus in the country were near 43,000. The NCDC said that the number of deaths from the virus increased by 21, raising the figure to 1,048. The NCDC announces that the new infections were recorded in 12 states and the FCT, with Lagos State having the highest number of infections with 42 cases, followed closely by the FCT with 25. Others are Katsina with 14 cases, Kaduna 11, Kwara 8, Undo 7, Delta 4, Anambra and Oyo, 3 each. Edo, Ogun and Oshun has two cases each and the Cross River, one. Joining us now via Zoom is Dr. Udo Phillips, Phillips in Jules. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips, for joining us. Thank you very much to have me. There's been a spike in the cases recently from Plateau State. In your expert thinking, what could be responsible for this? Well, thank you very much for um, this opportunity. Actually, in the last uh, six days or a little bit more, we've had uh, number the numbers of cases of new, a number of new cases of um, COVID nineteen in Plateau has actually been the highest around the country, and there's been a lot of questions. And I was just trying to do a little analysis, you know, just a, a few time back to see why this could be possible. And one of the main reasons I, I found is that on the plateau here, we're doing a lot more testing, um, maybe relative to other places. And that is true because we have um, up to about three centers testing right now. I know that the uh, National Veterinary Research Institute of VOM and then the just University Teaching Hospital where I work, we actually have uh, um, test centers there and then there's also a center of human virology in the plateau state specialist hospital and these centers are actually actively testing and as of the last check we you know on the plateau we've actually had this was like around the 20th of august as a 20th of august were tested up to up to about 23,000 persons you know got, got 23,000 samples and as at that time about 21,000 of the samples actually had had the results coming. So I think testing has contributed greatly to finding cases. Now, um, the government also made a statement around, uh, I, think, I think about two weeks ago on this and actually confirmed this statement that we're testing a lot more. And then, but I think one of the things that is regrettable is that there might just have been um, a kind of reduction as to the adherence to the public health interventions, the non-pharmaceutical public health interventions that people are supposed to adhere with, which is okay. uh, the uh, physical distancing, the use of proper use of face mask and the hand hygiene. Yeah, which is we'll, hand we'll, we'll get to maybe um, get your thoughts more on the adherence to some of these uh, uh, basic protocols set out by the PTF. Uh, before we go there, there's been comments about the weather in Joss playing a role um, in the increasing number of cases uh, because the more, uh, I mean, before now we heard that it thrives in cold environment while the heat sends it further away. Is there any truth to this assertion? Well, thank you very much. I think epidemiologically speaking, um, the truth about this particular virus is that it is a respiratory virus. And we know that for respiratory viruses, there may be seasonality. But I, I had to check uh, um, some articles on um, some scientific papers that have just recently been published. And what is said is at times of higher humidity, that is where you have more, more water in the air, you know, humidity like that, um, it's, it's, a little, it's, it's a little less, um, it's a little more difficult for the virus to be transmitted. The virus would like cold, dry seasons where the droplets, you know, will travel further and, it, you know, the communicability is actually higher. So, yes, just is a little cold right now, but it's also raining. So I would not say 
that that is the main cause. For instance, if you look at the U.S. and the, the, the cases we've had in the U.S., which are very, very much, the U.S. is actually hot and, you know, and, and humid as it is in the summer. So why is it that they've had a lot of cases, you know, that they've had over the time? So I do not know if that is what is really driving the cases for JOS. Yes, JOS is cold, but it's also humid. So um, I think you, you, you also a believe that increased to testing uh, plays a role here. Let, let's talk about some of the concerns you expressed um, about the uh, lack of adequate adherence to some of the protocols set out for safety and uh, containment of the virus. What concerns you the most about this uh, for the people of Plateau State? I, I think that I've made observations that I think people have come to a phase of lethargy you know, the whole COVID story. I, I, I think that there are some people who do not even believe that there's any COVID-19 currently. And you see that from their behavior, you know, you go to places, open places like markets, like, you know, uh, social gatherings, you find people not using masks. You see, you know, in public transport, people, you know, have their faces uncovered or people in, inappropriately putting their masks over the chin. I saw one person who put the mask over the forehead like that. You know, and it's 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 incredible that people do not believe this. Yes, there has been a lot of conspiracy the uh, conspiracy theories, but I think people must know that COVID nineteen is real, and I don't know if that has a lot to contribute on the plateau. So no, I no, think no, that is, is, is that attitude maybe try to adhere to these measures. I think people are largely tired and they just want to get around their own business. And yeah, as, as something needs to give definitely if we have to uh, wipe this disease out completely. Um, but what you were saying just brought to mind um, the attitude of some patients who have tested positive. Um, they're not wanting to be admitted to isolation centers. What is responsible for this um, sort of behavior, uh, which, I mean, a lot of persons would say could compound their situation. Um, what's your stand on this? Well, I think, first of all, is the, the large amount of uncertainty around the whole disease. COVID-19 is new, no matter what you hear on the news and all of that. There's still a lot not known about the disease. So people are largely uncertain as to what it is, as to what the outcomes are. And then the whole idea of being isolated away from family, away from, you know, the known spaces and places, you know, in some isolation center apparently has a lot to affect the minds of those um, who are being asked into isolation. But I think if people can see that this would make for the public good, for instance, being isolated and removed away from community and placed in a place where you can get some treatment would actually better your outcome and would protect those you have you know, uh, been familiar to be with. I think if people understand that, then there will be a lot of progress being made. So I think it's largely a misunderstanding. What does isolation really mean? Does it mean being away, being separated, you know, being removed from, you know, familiar places into what? So I think that has been a major problem for those uh, patients, understandably so. Uh, let's talk about this um, fresh strike called by the resident doctors. How do you think it will impact the treatment of COVID-19 uh, patients in the state? Well, certainly um, the health workforce, the frontliners, like we, we've called them since the onset of COVID-19, um, play a very huge role in the treatment and management of uh, patients with COVID-19. And certainly uh, because we're dealing with resident doctors who are uh, kind of like the foot soldiers, you know, dealing with the, the COVID cases, uh, this strike is really going to um, affect, um, uh, I mean, the, the treatment and management of COVID, particularly because um, one of the core treatment centers on the plateau is the Josh University Teaching Hospital, where most of the residents are. And then the Plateau State Specialist Hospital also has residents, even though they are under the state. Uh, so I think that with the strike, particularly because we do not have any uh, exclusive, um, there's nothing exclusive for those workers working at the, you know, the COVID centers. So certainly it's going to be a hit. Um, I'm sure other health workers in other um uh, in, in the other sectors, maybe the state and the private, may actually would actually feel the brunt of, of that coming to them. But I think it's certainly going to contribute to there is reoccurring concerns that you know make the association to go on strike. Why do you uh, think for maybe the government is not playing um, to the agreement that has been reached? 
Well, you know, um, certainly it's not easy to be in government. I'm not, I may not be speaking for government, but um, the whole issue about financing has been a problem from day one. And if you see the new communique mm -hmm. that the resident doctors issued just today, you realize that it, it has largely stemmed from some kind of, um, I mean, you know, the, the residents perceive that, that the government isn't taking the whole um, issue of financing the residency training a lot more serious. A lot of the issues have come from, you know, amply paying up, you know, some of the emoluments that are due to resident doctors. These are doctors that have, you know, worked and have fought bearing the brunt of, you know, this whole thing. And and so to, to have a government that, you know, seems not to be committed in just doing the barest minimum for things to work is actually the pain of the resident. And I, I think that that's largely where the issue is. Um, I would like to take you on other issues, but we're pressed for time. Hopefully we'll have you again on the news. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me.